drum. What was your, your okay. first attract? What was the first attraction to you for, to the drums? Uh, well, actually, um, when I was about twelve years old, thirteen years old, I went to see Jerry Lee Lewis in uh, in a theatre in uh, Southwest London. My dad took me, and I, my older brother Colin, and a couple of other friends who played in bands at the time. And he brought his uh, drummer over from the States. And I started learning uh, to play the piano, actually. My father was a piano player. My older brother was a played piano. But when I sort of saw the drummer and like, I went, uh, it's louder than the piano. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll take them up instead. And uh, that was sort of the start. I can play like a 12 bar in the key of C, which... Uh, it's not too popular with most guitar players, so uh, I am asking on my own on that one. Um, but th that was the start. Jerry Lee Lewis was um, my first musical influence, along with Johnny Cash and uh, early Elvis Presley on the Sun label and Carl Perkins, stuff like that. So uh, that's what got me going. Talking about the, the blues scene in London in the 60s, what distinguished the sound for you for, to the British blues bands as compared to the American? Um, we didn't know how to play it properly. <laughs> uh, it, it was, well, you know, it, um, I first started playing the drums when I was uh, 13, and I first joined my first band when I was 17. And I, I, I had, uh, my favourite record at the time was uh, Muddy Waters Live at the Newport Jazz Festival in 1960. Ah, uh, yes. And there was a drummer on there called uh, Francis Clay. And, and, and uh, to this day, I think it's one of the greatest live recordings of a, of a blues band ever. Uh, I can't help but I'm a fan, you know. I mean, that's what sort of got me started with this. But mm. it's, um, Muddy was Muddy was just incredible he, with his with his first band that he had. I mean, everybody who played in his band, his band on piano and uh, uh, what was the drummer's name? Francis Clay. What was the question, by the way? I'm starting to ramble, haven't I? <laughs> Comparison <laughs> between the, the, the British blues bands as compared to the American. Well, was... well all right, all right. Uh, so I'm listening to this record and I'm sort of trying to cop some of the licks that Francis Clay's playing and I'm not, not, get, not getting anywhere near it. So now I move on to uh, Chuck Berry's songs. Now, I'm getting a little bit better at that. Now, there was a drummer on Chuck Berry's stuff... Um, a guy called Freddie Bilo did most of the stuff, and uh, and I could sort of get that a little bit better. But it was um, we were trying to sort of figure out how they played, and of course, you know, and it wasn't a question of copying because we couldn't really copy. We were sort of like getting as close as we could, uh, and then something else came out. But the, the real thing I think that made it different or special is because. Uh, for some reason, you know, uh, a lot of the, you know musicians, young musicians in, around London, had a real passion for American blues music. Um, I mean, I used to go down to Ilpi Island and see the Stones and, and, and watch them at um, uh, the Marquee in London and the Yardbirds. The Stones were, were a great band, and uh, there was another great band called Cyril Davis Rhythm and Blues All Stars, and it was. I guess he was sort of trying to sort of copy it. I mean, we all sang with American accents, or tried anyway. Um, I'm not not exactly sure why, but I, but I think it was really because, uh, you know, we could relate to it. The music was was real. There was like a, a real honesty about it. And, um, you know, I think, you know, you always sort of you tend to put your own sort of spin on something as opposed to copying somebody. I think at the beginning we tried to copy, but it wasn't a copy. We sort of uh, bastardised it a little bit, and uh, for some reason it seemed to work. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> How do you look back on your time with Savoy Brand now in terms of your grounding as a musician? Um, I, uh, I, look on, I look back on it very fondly, actually, even though I didn't get paid for the first six weeks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the blues band... Um, you know, I got my first start with Savoy. Um, it was interesting. Um, I, I auditioned, first of all, with a friend of mine, a bass player called Dave Hutchins, who was in the first band I was in from school. And uh, they were looking for a bass player and a drummer. Well, they thought that we were, like, mates, and they figured, like, it was either both of them or none. 
Anyway, uh, they gave a bloke called Bill Bruford the job, but apparently he couldn't play a shuffle, so he got nixed after about three weeks, and I got a phone call from him again asking him, asking me if I'd like to sort of play in the band or try out again. I said, yeah. So I borrowed Dad's car, drove uh, up in, um, in Battersea, I think, in a club in Battersea, southwest London, and uh, went there, played for about two or three hours, and uh, nothing was really said. They just started packing up equipment and stuff. So I started packing up my drums, putting them in the car, and I was going to go back to uh, my day job. I was a commercial artist. And they said, but where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to go back to my day job. Why? They said, well, we've got a gig in Birmingham tonight. <laughs> 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 and that was it. Actually, um, I have very, very fond memories of that. Um, I came to the States in uh, 68, Mr. Boy, and uh, it was just like, um, uh, I guess for some going to Mecca or going to Israel, it was like a religious experience for me. Uh, you know, I met B.B. Uh, King and, and Albert King and uh, all sorts of, uh, actually, and Chuck Berry. Though I didn't get to shake, shake Chuck's hand. We did a show with Chuck Berry, and uh, we asked our manager at the time, I said, can you... Uh, can you see if we can have a picture taken with, with Chuck? And like, you know, say hello to him. And there's a picture of our manager holding on to Chuck's hand and Chuck's walking with his guitar towards his big white Cadillac convertible with a big blonde sitting in there saying, sure, any time. And he just kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I love Chuck Berry's music. It was uh, great stuff. I think um, most uh, rock and roll bands from like the 60s on out It'd be uh, almost out of work without Chuck Berry. And, um, and his, his guitar playing and, and songwriting was uh, nothing short of magic, certainly for me when I was a kid growing up and listened to it. It was, it was always on the record player. So was there any particular catalyst uh, for you and Dave wanting to leave Savoy Brown and form your own band? I, I'm sorry, just say that again, would you? Was there any particular catalyst that, that set off you and Dave wanting to leave Savoy Brander and forming your own band? Oh, yeah. Um, we were getting paid uh, 60 bucks a week and we were earning $15,000 a night. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, uh, we got paid whether we worked or not, but we were working, you know, five or six days a week. And it was just, you know what, it was just time for a change. And, and to be fair, I think it was for Kim also. Um, the band was doing famously, and I, I know a lot of Savoy Brown fans think, tended to think that that sort of version, either with Dave singing or with Chris Jordan singing, was probably one of the better versions. But to be fair, they had a bunch of hit records after we left. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, still, I, I'm still good friends with Kim. In fact, I talked to him uh, last week. Um, we might be doing some shows together either later this year or next year, so... Uh, Oh, fantastic. Yeah. No, no, no problems there. I mean, he gave me my first shot. I owe him something, don't I? <laughs> yes. No, I, uh, no, no, he owes me that first six weeks. What was it? Uh, it was £12.50, I think, a week. Uh, don't go there, Roger. I'm sorry. Carry on, John. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it was Dave that came up with the Fog Hat name. Uh, was it a name you were happy with at first? The, the name? Uh, yeah, yeah, Dave came up with that. Um, when he was, uh, I think he was about 13 or 14, he was playing like a kind of scra Scrabble word game with his uh, brother, John. And uh, good name, that, right? And mm. uh, Dave made up this word, fog hat. And his brother said, that's not a real word. And Dave said, uh, uh, yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> 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 Sibling rivalry. Um, actually, we, we'd finished the first album. Dave Edmund produced it for us. And we were on our way up to London to look at the artwork, the, artwork, the front cover. And we realised we didn't have a name for the band, so uh, I think we decided as we were walking up the steps to the uh, art studio, like what we were going to be called. It's stuck. It doesn't really mean anything. It just means us. Yeah. yeah. You, you were quick to gain success in America. Did you see that as your market right away? Was that an early priority for you? Uh, well, actually, there was, there was a couple of things going on. Um, when, after we left Savoy Brown, the manager, um, who was Kim's brother, Harry Simmons, uh, when we decided we, we were going to leave, um, 
We said we'd stay until the tour was over or whatever they wanted to do, but we were going to leave. Well, I mean, you know, 60 bucks a week and they're getting ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a night. It's pretty stupid, you know. Mm. So, um, he said, he told us that we'd never work again in England. And, true to, and he managed Boy Brown and Chicken Shack. So um, he told the agency if they booked us, um, that he'd take them somewhere else. And the same thing with uh, promoters. Though we did get a three-week tour with uh, Captain Beefheart after we'd finished um, our first album. Um, Derek Taylor, who was the publicist for the Beatles, um, took a shine to us and uh, became, uh, I don't know what you would call it, he just tried to get us work and dates and sent the record around to different uh, record companies and stuff. And uh, he got us a three-week tour with Captain Beefheart, which was a lot of fun, which was about the only dates I think we ever did in England so uh, uh, then we were we couldn't get dates through any of the agencies because of Harry Simmons and then the next thing happened our manager who was American called up and said we have uh, we have a hit record on our hands I just want to make love to you was like in the top 40 so uh, came over here for about 13 months I think the first tour <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the wife didn't think too much about that. <laughs> you, She's you forgiven had, me. She's forgiven me. We're good friends now. Oh, good. <laughs> you, you had the legendary manager Albert Grossman in in your corner. Well, Tell us actually, about Albert was Albert was the uh, owned the record label. He wasn't actually our manager. Our manager's name was Tony Otida, mm -hmm. and he and I had become good friends um, when we were in Savoy Brown touring over here. And then uh, when Savoy Brown came back and toured over here without myself and Dave, um, he gave me a call. And uh, anyway, but Albert was the one who gave us um, our real chance. Um, we finished our first album. Uh, we did a bunch of them at Abbey Road and a few other studios around London. And all, all the songs that we, uh, about seven of the songs that were on the first album were on there, probably not sounding quite as good as they did after Dave Edmonds got his grubby fingers on it. But uh, every record company turned us down. Um, all the majors, all the minors, they said, no, they weren't interested. They wanted somebody like Carol King or James Taylor. Not that there's anything wrong with Carol King. I love her, actually. I think she's probably one of the greatest songwriters ever. But um, we couldn't get arrested. Nobody wanted the rest. Nobody wanted the band on the record company. And Albert Grossman was had come over to Europe and was in London at the time, touring with uh, the band who he managed. And uh, Tony, our manager, knew Albert and convinced Albert that he would come down and see us. He'd actually heard the uh, demos that we'd made. But he came. To, we rented a little club in uh, North London in Islington, and uh, Albert came down one afternoon. And he was sitting about 20 feet in front of us. Nobody else was there, just Albert and Tony, and maybe his chauffeur or something. And uh, you know, we started playing, and Albert visibly sort of took a step back in his seat because you know we had our high watts and Marshalls roaring. And after about six or seven songs, he said, "Okay." Um, Anywhere we can go and get some tea and biscuits. So I said, yeah, he said that. Uh, so we go across. I said, yeah, there's a, there's a hotel across the road. So we go across the road to this hotel. Albert orders tea and biscuits. And he's a really cool guy. And he's sitting there, and, and he sort of he had this thing where he would rub his fingers around uh, his cuticles. You know, he'd, he'd sit there, and he had this big long silver mane tied back in a ponytail. Very striking looking gentleman. And he said. Well, okay, let's do it. <laughs> it's funny, and, uh, even to this day, I still get like chills because, I mean, Albert Grossman, he's managing the band, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, Peter Paul and Mary, Janis Joplin. I mean, if Albert Grossman says let's do it, it something's going to get done. Yes. So uh, about two or three weeks later, he sent us ten thousand dollars so we could go into the studio and we started working up in Rockfield Wales and that was where we met Dave Edmonds and we convinced him that he needed to work with us because 
we needed a helping hand. <laughs> uh, that's how it started. Yeah, Albert was terrific. He was um, he gave us his backing, enabled us to sort of you know make it over here. And uh, you know the band could play. I mean, he, Albert sort of knew that he, what he was getting, but you know without his support, I don't think we'd have been uh, anywhere near as successful as we were. Speaking of Dave Edmonds, you worked with a variety of producers in those early days. Did they all bring something different to the table, production-wise? Uh, yeah, actually, we really enjoyed working with Dave. Uh, Dave Edmonds on the first album. In fact, he even worked, did about half of the second album. Except he said he he really needed to go back to uh, Rockfield in Wales to to mix it. Um, we never heard from him again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, I, and I've seen Dave since then, and we've talked, but we haven't talked about that particularly. But fortunately, uh, we had copies of all the tracks we've done, and uh, we got a couple of other people to help us out. Um, Dave was going through some issues, but he was a brilliant producer. Yeah, we worked with... And then Tom Dawes, who was a friend of um, our manager, uh, Tom uh, brought a lot of musicality to it. He uh, he actually did mostly jingles and stuff like that. Though he was uh, a very accomplished musician himself. Uh, he played bass, guitar, piano, a whole bunch of stuff. I did a lot of arranging for other artists. Um, yeah, we we used a bunch of different producers, but personally, I think um, Nick Jameson uh, brought the best out of this band, uh, along with probably with Dave Evans on the first album. Um, Nick Jameson was my favorite producer to work with and as a musician, he brought the best out of everybody in the band and he had great fingers. Now, when talking about Foghat, it would be impossible for Slow Ride not to come up in, in the conversation. Could you yeah. see the potential of that song straight away on recording it? Could say that again? Could you see the hip potential of that song straight away when you recorded it? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we we were recording in a studio in uh, up in Vermont. Actually, it was, a, it was 1975. Nick Jameson had just joined us on bass. Tony Stevens had left the band. Well, we'd asked him to go actually. Uh, and I lived up in uh, in between Long Island and Woodstock. And uh, Nick Jameson lived up in Woodstock. And we were good friends. We'd go out and jam at the uh, Bear and uh, various places up there. Nick was a very accomplished uh, musician as well as a great producer and uh, I said you know do you want to come out and join the band he said yeah I said can you play bass he said yeah actually Nick's one of those people who can play everything well I hate people like that you know, I have to struggle we have to practice us mere mortals with people like him anyway I, I digress um, so we we found this uh we took some time off. Of, Nick joined the band. We took some time off the road because we wanted to sort of, you know, give it our best shot. We've been working back more or less continuously until uh, to '75, except when we'd go in the studio, then we'd be back on the road. So we took about three months off the road, and we found uh, Nick and I went up to various studios. We found this place in Sharon, Vermont, it's on the top of a mountain, in the middle of nowhere, no distractions. You know, we were easily distracted. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, we started working on it and uh, Slow Ride was actually um, it was done in a, Rod, Rod Price our lead guitar and slide player uh, owned a, shared a house down here on Long, Long Island and um, when Nick first joined the band we were jamming and it came from a jam from the uh, basement tapes it was basically the same arrangement as went on the record anyway we started recording it uh, we got about halfway through the song just where there's a breakdown where the drums and bass do a thing and uh, the power went out i don't know i think a moose had run into one of the poles or something and uh so we had we stopped playing and about we came back about three weeks later when they got power back on we're in the middle of nowhere up in sharon vermont it's like in the middle of nowhere and uh Next, we started playing the tape, the first part of the tape, and we all liked it. And we said, I said, all right, I'll just start playing along with it, and we'll, everybody joins in. So we matched up the drum sounds. It was the same drum kit anyway. And uh, 
we just started playing. So after the we did the drum, bass breakdown, and then where it speeds up at the end. So and then we joined the two pieces together. Nick, he's uh, such a clever bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and yes, at the time we felt Nick and I particularly felt very strongly about it. Anyway, we we mixed. Uh, Dave and Rod went back to the island, Long Island, New York, where they were living. Uh, and I stayed up there with Nick to finish the mixing. Actually, Nick did all the mixing. I just would bring in tea and biscuits and stuff like that. And say, that's really good. Can you turn the drums up a bit? Um, so we, we mixed that and another song off the, uh, off the Fool for the City album. Uh, I think it was called Save Your Loving. And then we drove back down to... Uh, the Bearsville Studios and saw Paul Fishkin who was the who was in charge of the record company and he said this is a single up to that point the band had never said talked about singles it was like that was up to the record company Paul Fishkin says well it's, it's a bit heavy and, it, and it's eight minutes long he said right but it's this is the, this is this is the new single he said well we can't we can't have an eight minute single and we said Yes, we can. We want an eight-minute single, and, this is, and it was the only time we ever argued with him. Uh, our manager was also said the same thing. You can't have an eight-minute single. Yes, we can. <laughs> anyway, we put an eight-minute single out, but of course the, the uh, radio uh, DJs edited it anyway. But um, yeah, that was the only song that we ever really felt strongly about as far as a single. And uh, it. How does the saying go? A slow ride been a very, very good to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a song that's developed a life of its own over the years. It, it Bob turns up in movies, TV shows. Does it feel like a runaway child at times? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of like that. And you know, it, it, it helped put the kids through college and um, you know pays a few bills still. Um, and apart from that. It, it's still a lot of fun to play. It was um, like, like I said originally, it came from like you know just jamming. It was basically um, uh, a John Lee Hooker riff. You know, uh, instead of played as a shuffle, it's played as like in in, in two four as opposed to a shuffle time. And um, is that blues influence again? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot of fun to play even even today. It's, uh, there's probably about half a dozen songs we have to play, but it's not a problem because we always like playing, you know. What, the band never had a problem, uh, you know, with people telling us what to play or not to play. The band always maintained uh, artistic control on whatever songs we did and how we did them. I don't know if that was such a good idea all the time, but um, it, it's, it's sort of the way it worked out. The band always maintained, like, artistic control, so... Yeah, we could rise or fall by it. Two two main impressions I've always got from Frog Hat: one that it's a band with a very strong work ethic, and two that it's never taken itself too seriously. It's always been straightforward rock and roll. Would they be fair comments? Uh, that would be very fair, actually, uh, John. Yeah, um, it's you know we it, that's what it was. It was blues, blues influenced rock and roll. In fact, London Dave once said. Yeah, we're a blues band. We just turned it up to eleven. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, there, there was there was a there was a long-standing um, joke between myself and Dave. Uh, we'd be sitting, in fact when we were doing the Fall for the City album, we were we called him Fall for the City, and I said, "Hey, Dave, how many chords are in that song?" And you where I was going with this? And he said, "There's only three, Rog, but there's a couple of passing chords, but they don't they don't count." <laughs> <laughs> because anything other than three chords has to be viewed with a certain amount of suspicion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you think that simplicity has been a, a big part of the, the longevity of the band, that you've always kept it that way? Um, no, we, I mean, we've ventured off into different things. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't just sort of play the, the, you know, the same sort of riff over and over again. I mean, we've made, I don't know, about 20 or 30 albums over the years uh, you know and it, it's um, you know writing music and write, or writing songs and, 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 and recording is like uh, it's kind of like sort of a moment in time that you say alright that's good or we like that and then you move on in fact I rarely actually sit down and listen to uh, 
the stuff up until I, you know, once we've recorded it and the, the record's out and you listen to the masters and you say, all right, and then you sort of let it go. Uh, it's like a, I don't know, like, like you said, it's like, like your kid. You go, all right, off you go, get out there, see what you can do. And, <clears throat> but it's, uh, just recently, um, they re-released the Bearsville catalogue in Europe and Asia. And I ha uh, as I'm basically the uh, lone remaining original member, I had to, uh, I was asked if I would, you know, review some of the stuff and tell stories. No porky pies, just stories. Uh, <laughs> so I, I had to sit down and listen to all the records. And, and it, I, I really enjoyed it. It was... Um, it was a lot of fun. I started listening to stuff in like a completely different light. When you haven't listened to a tune for in like 25 or 30 years, and, and you go, wow, that was pretty good. And then it's sort of, what did I do there? I listened to that. Um, yeah, I'm, generally speaking, I'm really proud of our body of work. Um, we always had a, we always worked hard. We, it was, you know, when you're in the studio, it's, it's serious stuff. You know, we, we pay attention, you know, we don't, Sit around getting drunk and stoned or anything, and uh, generally, it's. Um, I was real pleased with it. It was. Um, it was quite refreshing to sit down and listen to stuff. In fact, it gave me some ideas about including some of those uh, tunes next year. Because in January, February, March, April, uh, we go down to Florida. Cause it's a little chilly up north here. Uh, then, and um, we rehearse and record, and uh, so I've got some ideas for next year. Fantastic. So how difficult a decision was it to make whether or not to go on after Dave sadly passed away? Um, well, if we were gonna, the thing is, well, yeah, it was, it was rough because um, it sort of came, I don't think you ever, uh, you know, expect, you know, you know somebody, what was he, 56? And... You know, we knew, I mean, it was cancer, and I kept, in, he came off the road for two years to fight, he had kidney cancer. And uh, they took one of his kidneys out, and, uh, you know, he went through the chemo and radiation and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we talked, you know, once a month, and said, how are you doing, Dave? And after about a year and a half, he calls me up and he says, uh, Rog, uh, I, I can keep an apple down, and uh, I, can, I can walk to the gym. I don't go in there, but... Um, you want to go out and play, and I, I remember it to this day. And I'm and I'm going, oh, thank God he's all right. Mm. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do that. So uh, uh, we put the original band back together. Um, there was Tony Stevens, Rob Price playing the lead and side guitar, and Dave. So uh, Tony and I talk, and uh, so. You know, I you know I started getting my chops back together. I sit in my drum room and start listening to songs. And Dave and I were in contact with each other. And then Rob Price decided that he he didn't want to go out and tour anymore. And that was when I said to Dave, "Well, you want me and Tony to like audition some guitar players up here in New York because Dave was living down in Florida." He said, "No, Brian would do it." And I said, "Brian?" He said, "Yeah, Brian Brassett will play guitar." I said, all right, so you don't really want us to, like, you know, audition some guitar players? He said, you can if you want, but Brian will do it. <laughs> so Brian Bassett was our next lead guitar player, and I thank Dave on a daily basis for doing that. Uh, mm. Brian Bassett is not only a, a great uh, musician, guitar player, engineer, producer, great slide player, uh, he's one of the best human beings I think I've ever had the pleasure to know and work with. So uh, that worked out great. And Rod, uh, Rod didn't want to go out on the road anymore. He had enough. He was teaching, uh, like blues and slide guitar. He was living um, up in Vermont. So how how heavy was the process in uh, seeking a replacement for Dave? Uh, I guess I don't really want to talk about that. It was, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was hard. Um, there was only one choice. Um, we, when Dave was alive, we did a, a show in um, Toledo, Ohio, and the opening act was 
Humble Pie. Now, we used to tour with Humble Pie when Stephen Marriott was alive, the original band back in uh, the early 70s. I mean, we were the support act and we got real tight with Stevie. We're on public radio, so I can't sort of start telling you stories about Stevie Marriott. <coughs> but he was, he was special and we got, we got real friendly with him and we'd hang out a lot. And he was great to the band. But he, I mean, the opening act, which was Fog Hat, he treated us great. Wouldn't let anybody, you know, you know, chop lights or chop sound. We got work, whatever we needed. Fog Hat got it. Stevie was something special. Anyway, um, Stevie had, had passed on, and uh, so Dave and I said, "Let's go and see what this bloke's got under his fingernails." He's singing Stevie Mar- I made Stevie Marriott tunes. So we go out there. The band started playing, and they they weren't they weren't very good actually. And then their singer Charlie Hoon started singing, and he sang Stevie Marriott songs like Stevie Marriott. I mean, if you're familiar with the way Stevie used to sing, he was hellacious. I mean, he mm. was an incredible singer, great guitar player, <coughs> and all that stuff. So Dave and I sat there and went, whoa. So after Dave passed, um, that, it was about three months afterwards, I, I, I was sent a whole bunch of like tapes and CDs and stuff. But I called up our road manager at the time and said, um, remember that guy who, who sang in Humble Pie? I, I, I couldn't remember his name. And he said, yeah, that's uh, Charlie Hume. <clears throat> I said, see if you can get his number for me. But, and anyway, the band wasn't doing it. Uh, uh, Humble Pie wasn't doing very well. The band wasn't all that good, I don't think. Um, there were no original members. Jerry Shirley, the drummer, had left and gone back to England. Um, so I didn't really have any compunction about stealing him from the band. And I called Charlie and asked him if he was interested. And he said, yeah. I sent him <coughs> about 30 songs on a cassette to listen to. And he called me up about two months later and said, got it. And I said, good. He came to the house there in Long Island, and we sat down in the living room and played for two or three days acoustically. <coughs> and uh, we rented a studio in Manhattan, and uh, off we went. Charlie Hune is a, is, is a great singer, great guitar player, and we're real, real lucky. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't really sound like Dave. He's just like a great singer and a great guitar player, the same as Dave was. And, uh, you know, we needed somebody like that. We get on really well. Uh, we become real good friends. We go fishing, play golf together, and other stuff we can't talk about on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a perfect match. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it worked out really good. Um, uh, and it, have you heard any of the new stuff? Yes, I have, yeah. Yeah, and Ch- Charlie is a great singer. And uh, he's a great front man, and uh, as I said, we're, we're good friends, so uh, it worked out all right. I think Dave would have approved, though. I think the, re- the reality is Dave would. Uh, I think Dave was probably rather pissed at the fact that he was taken a bit too soon. I think he'd much rather be down there playing. Of course, there again, yeah. I don't know for sure. <laughs> 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 now you, you I'll recent... find out one day, won't I? <laughs> you will. <laughs> Yeah. Your recent CD, Last Train Home, it's a real return to the blues origins of the band. Is that something you felt a, a strong need to do, to get back to the roots of it all? Yeah. Um, it was something that Dave and I talked about over the years. I mean, I mean, just about every Fogat record we made, um, there was some nod to, uh, uh, you know, a tune we grew up playing when we were, you know, learning our craft. And... Um, what happened was uh, we, we did a radio show out here on Long Island one day and um, my brother was here, Colin, and uh, we did some blues. To, my brother, Colin, plays piano. <clears throat> we did some stuff for this radio show and then we did some recording up here in New York and then we went back down to Florida about six months after that. Uh, my brother also came over and we had a harp player, uh, a bass player, Craig, couldn't play on that record. But um, we had a great bass player, and we had the time of our lives. A good friend of mine, Eddie Bluesman Kirkland, who I'd worked with in uh, 77 in New York, um, came down and played a bunch of songs. But there's only two of them got on the album, but we did it. We recorded about six or seven songs with him. 
he was something special as well. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We just sat in the room. Uh, what we did was uh, everybody picked two tunes that you want to do. Uh, we wrote uh, three or four songs, I think, and uh, said everybody pick two, you know, uh, blues tunes that you want to do, and um, we'll play them and see what works. And I got to tell you, it was. Um, a real labor of love. We had a blast doing it. Uh, very rarely any of the songs are more than <coughs> the second or third take. And uh, we had a whole plethora of uh, extra tunes that we didn't make it on there. But um, it was a lot of fun. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope if Dave ever got a chance to hear it, he thought it was all right too. But um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And I enjoyed doing it, especially working with my brother, uh, Colin, who uh, actually he's been to Oz. Um, he used to be the piano player in Mungo Jerry. Oh, yes, yeah. And uh, he went down there, and Ray Dorsett was the singer in the first band that I was ever in. And we went to school together. And uh, they'd been to Australia, and Colin told me how wonderful it was. He loved it. Uh, I think Mungo Jerry had a bunch of hits um, in the summertime, of course, Lady Rose, a bunch of other things. So he said Australia was, um, he didn't want to leave, I don't think. That, that's, an amazing, <laughs> that's an amazing coincidence. I've got a couple of CDs sitting on my desk in front of me now that I just received from Ray in the mail. So yeah, he, he's still pushing his wares down here in Australia. He's, yeah. We should come there, shouldn't we? You should. Should. Yeah, I would, I, I would. I would love to actually. Um, in fact, in fact, uh, my my cousin has, has told us. Uh, oh, let me get this little bit in. Hello, Jill. Um, <laughs> in Sydney. Yeah, it, 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 Jill in Sydney is my cousin, Jill Russell, and Pat, her husband. I love Jill. She uh, she's a straight shooter, a straight talker, and uh, actually, yeah, uh, proper Australian, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jill. We'll be down one day. Uh, where were we? I think we were there. Oh, I've got one thing I've got to con- congratulate you for is your recent induction into the New York uh, Blues Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, I wasn't quite sure how that happened. I, I think it's something like if you hang around long enough, somebody's going to take notice. But, um, you know, it's like I, I'm, I'm in some pretty uh, illustrious company there. Well, actually, it's a good company. But, um, you know, I think, I think it's because I never really forgot how to be a fan. And it's, it's, I'm really looking forward to it, but I'm not really... I mean, you know, I think Dave, Lunson Dave, should actually be inducted. Um, if he's not, then uh, I guess maybe we'll work on that. I mean, he was the, the one in the band who had all the records um, he was the one who would lead the way as far as like you know different blues tunes that we recorded and stuff. So, I mean, some Dave should be inducted. Yeah, why not? Work with some, with the powers of be. But uh, it rather it rather surprised me, other than the fact that you know I played with you know a bunch of sort of great blues men, and uh, uh, and I'm a fan of the blues. Always have been, always will. Um, I don't know. How do you induct drummers into the Blues Hall of Fame? I'll take it. I'll be there. They're going <laughs> to have yeah. a party. That's for me. <laughs> That's right. Don't don't knock it. <laughs> hey, fantastic, Roger. Thanks so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure to check, catching up with you, and uh, thanks for all the wonderful music over the years, and we're sure there's still uh, plenty of life in Foghat yet. Yeah. yeah, it's good talking to you, John. All right, thank you very much. Good on you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.